Mm -hmm. So we still have people signing in. Quite a list from all over the place. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised. So uh, we will begin. The first thing to say is, is I am not Michael Lerner. And uh, my name is Steve Heilig. Some of you I can already see, I know. And uh, he asked me to step in here because he's otherwise occupied this morning. And so I am one of the other primary hosts for the new school. And I uh, was happy to do that. And our speakers or our, our guests today are great old friends as well. So this is the new school at Commonweal series of uh, talks on all sorts of issues, the Friday morning ones we've been doing for quite some time now with a wide variety of people. But we sort of are doing internal today because our guests today are two dear friends and longtime Commonweal associates and active people and famous even, we could say. So uh, the topic is being old. And I was going to sign in and listen to this anyway because I don't know anything about that yet. But um, um, I love the directness of it because it's just being, for one thing. And old is, of course, a somewhat arbitrary uh, category. What age is that? I don't know. Mm. But obviously, we're in a very interesting time in human history where there are more people living longer than ever before. And uh, life expectancy, you know, 100 years ago in the United States, for example, was about 47 years. And it has gone up to the point where other things being equal, nowadays, somebody born today might have an average life expectancy of 100 years. Now, that has been going down somewhat. And that, that's information from the famous Buck Institute in Marin, uh, which is an, a research institute on aging. It has leveled off in the United States, at least, uh, for a variety of reasons, such as the opioid epidemic and things like that. We'll see what the current pandemic does to this as well. But I think it's safe to say that we clearly have more people living longer in the developed world, at least, and it's increasing all over than ever before. And so what does that mean to people? And how do we do that in the healthiest way, in the most satisfying way, uh, in the rewarding way? Uh, there's a lot of questions and, and they're, they're scientific, they're ethical, they're spiritual, they're psychological. And so our two uh, guests here, and you've read about them, I won't go into their biographies, but they're uh, extensive and impressive, but they actually meet and talk every Thursday evening about all sorts of things anyway. So the idea here is we would extend that into a Friday morning and uh, kind of listen in and have a discussion with them and the things that they're thinking about these days about going forward in life uh, really as healthily and as reward in a rewarding sense as they can. So I would like both of them to just say something in terms of welcome, and, and uh, then we can get into a dialogue. So Rachel, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Stephen. Thank you for being here. Um, for being old, um, yeah, you know, it's different than being a regular person with gray hair. It's very different. And for me, I think there's been an actual line that you cross and you're in another country. And that line is 80. I am presently 82. And I have gone from being an ordinary person with gray hair to uh, being old. And there's a lot to it that uh, is surprising. In fact, a lot of it is very, very surprising. And I just like to offer some thoughts first about being old and then hear Marion have her piece to say, which I, <laughs> is always wonderful. Um, I remember my mother telling me that I would love being an old lady. And at the time I must have been in my 20s. And I, I said, you know, mom, why, why, why is that? Why would I love being an old lady? And she said, it's the best disguise in the world. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I have to laugh because she's absolutely right. And I also have to laugh 
about all this fuss about masks and wearing masks, right? Because uh, everyone over 65 is already wearing a mask. <laughs> and um, it's, a little, it's a little surprising at what happens to you in general interaction with people when you were really an old person. Um, when I was a little girl, I always wanted to have a cloak of invisibility. I mean, that was my fantasy at six and seven and eight. I would be able to drop this cloak over myself. And then I would be sort of be there and find out what's really happening and what people were really thinking. Um, and I have it now. It's called being old. It's people say and do things right in front of you as if you're not there. They don't register you at all. And I have a young assistant. Often we're shopping together. Sometimes we're shopping for big things, sometimes for little things. But no one ever talks to me when we're shopping. As the salespeople, they talk to her. She's about 31. And at one point she got fed up with that and we were about to pay for some major thing. And the salesperson talked to her and I'm standing right there. And she says to the salesperson, why don't you talk to her? She's the one with the wallet. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it was so shocking, mm -hmm. so shocking. And just to wind up this initial thought about the invisibility and my mother saying, I would love this. Um, it can be used very powerfully, but it's also stunning how, how profound this is at almost every level of society, except for the children. The children notice you immediately. Nobody else does. <laughs> right? And I wanted to tell a story out of my, um, my past, um, uh, out of my profession. Um, one of my students, a young doctor, uh, had a benign brain tumor. And it converted into something very malignant. And she lived in Southern California. And she wanted to come up to our hospital, our major teaching hospital, one of the best hospitals in America, to see the chief of neurosurgery um, about the possibility of having a surgical intervention um, and whether or not this was possible. And her husband stayed there in Southern California with the children, her two young children, and she was going to fly up here and go to this consultation. And I said to her, no, you're not going alone. I'll go with you. So the two of us went to this consultation. And we ended up sitting for an hour after our appointment date time, right, in a room that measured about 10 feet by 10 feet. And in this room was an examining table and an x-ray box with all of her x-rays of her brain uh, on, on, on the box. And finally, the surgeon came in. He said his name to her and began to tell her, show her on the, on the x-rays that there was no hope for surgery for her. And essentially, this was a death sentence. And I'm sitting there. There's a little table, about big enough for two people, a little tiny table with a chair sitting next to it. I'm in that chair. If I were to reach out my hand, I could have touched this man. He never acknowledged my presence. He simply talked to her, didn't even ask her name. He just talked to her about the situation. And then he left. So about two and a half weeks later, um, the Department of Neurosurgery had asked me to come as a consultant because they wanted to help the young residents and some of their doctors uh, interact better with patients, have a better experience because the patient ratings on the department were pretty bad. Right? 
So I was there and they had called a meeting of some 25 people and I talked about my expertise, which is helping people to reconnect to the meaning of their work, their life purpose, their hearts, their humanity, and recognizing that who they are is as important as what they know, especially in the field that they're in. And we talked for about an hour and a half. This doctor was there at the meeting. At the end of the meeting, we all stand up and he comes over to me and he says, oh, Dr. Rimmon, I am so happy to meet you. I've been looking forward to meeting you. Loved your books, blah, 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 blah. And I look at him and I can see he has never seen me before. I was a foot away from him for 30 minutes and he has never seen me before. And I say, you know, we've actually met. And he said, when was this? And I tell him two weeks ago when you were doing that consultation on the young doctor with uh, glioblastoma. And he says, what? I said, yes, I was in the room. He said, well, I didn't see you. He said, oh, I understand. If I had seen you, I would have thought you, should, you were her mother. I would have oh. known it was you. <laughs> <laughs> Visibility is present always, and it allows you to see a great deal more about life and people than you might ordinarily know. So, Mary, and your thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite a story, Rachel. <laughs> yes, yes, that's well, you know, um, I have practiced invisibility all my life because of what I was born into. I know how to do it. Uh, I know how to turn it on and turn it off. So I just throw that in there. So as an elder, um, it's actually changing. I, I feel in some ways more visible because my shield uh, is down because of my vulnerability. And when we're vulnerable, um, you know, we're just right out there to receive kindness and grace that will come our way to help us out. So it doesn't make any sense to be invisible uh, when we're old, if we don't, I think it's better to be visible if possible, but I know it can be a problem when people can't see you. But the thing is, I can't see people either because my eyes are so bad. <laughs> so it's an issue, but um, yeah. So um, I, I think, you know, it's, our culture is is not really um, uh, elder friendly uh, as much as uh, let's say in Tibet or uh, wherever other places in the world. It, we we uh, it's more a youth culture, but um, that can turn around uh, if we notice um, the openings for that turning to happen, and and so part of what. Uh, Rachel, I think it's for us important to, to, to reference and talk about is what are we noticing um, as elders that we haven't noticed earlier in our life? And um, I, I find I spend a lot of time just pondering, thinking about things. Uh, I don't rush into things anymore. And so th there's time to notice in a different way. Do you find that to be true, Rachel? That there's a different quality of noticing that's coming to you right now. Oh, I think that's so real. Um, yeah. yeah. You know, for, for me, um, there's something else that goes with it. Uh, there's a sense of gratitude. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, you know, there's our, my life is so much richer mm -hmm. than I thought it was. <laughs> yeah. There's so many uh, more extraordinary things happening around me than I ever noticed before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, fi I find that to be uh, true as well. And just uh, daily gratitude. You and I talked about, you know, what it's like in the morning when we get out of our beds. We put our feet down and we slowly stand up and we say, oh, thank you. <laughs> I have another day to walk in, right? <laughs> because I never know, you know, whether my legs are going to carry me in a good, strong way. So it, there's always that feeling of, of gratitude and um, uh, just to be able to stand and be upright. Uh, and so I think both of you have 
both of us have felt that and um it's a, it's a, a practice that's so so beautiful to to be in the, the gratitude and practice is uh, it, it allows um a lighterness of spirit to, to be there and and as elders that's the joy for me is that i don't dwell in anything that is uh, you know full of woe and 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 that's hard to be with that's stressful because we can't afford to do that as elders to be in the stress conditions you find that so rachel that there's a way of um of just being more fluid in our in our feelings as we go along out of necessity first of all to survive right <laughs> well you know I, yeah but i don't you have an experience i don't have a position anymore i used to oh. be a judgmental, judgmental person uh-huh and it, Judgment was my go-to response to anything new. Mm -hmm. Did I like it? That I didn't like? Was it good? Was it bad? Was it silly or not? So all the all these things, and I'm just there. Yeah, I'm just an observer, and I see so much more than I ever saw before. And it's I think I, maybe we're just more present, Marion. We're just. Yeah, I I think so. I, I, I find that that to be true, too. The place where I get stuck, I guess, a little bit is um, working with fear. And, and you know, um, fear will come up for me. And then I have to really focus on it to fluff it up and look at it from different perspectives. But I do do that. And um, then, that, then I can release it, right? Because we know from our Santre work that if you carry fear and judgment, uh, the cre creative spirit cannot rise up. It gets squished, it gets uh, suppressed. So I, I think, um, I don't know whether fear is an issue for you or not, but it, it does come to me from time to time, but I don't let it linger because I, I know I can't be uh, full of, uh, creative thoughts, open to surprise and generosity, all these things, if I, if I have fear. Well, you know, I think in, in today's world with COVID, mm -hmm. fear is the, um, is everywhere. And yeah, it is, it is. A lot of people are, are afraid to even look at the fear, look mm -hmm. at the possibility. And, you know, having had fear about my body, since I was very young, because I had this long-term chronic illness, you know, my body's never been very reliable. It's a way of waking up. I can't explain this better, but it, it makes you very awake, very um, in the present, in the present. Um, I think it's clear, it, it, it changes everything. And I don't see it as fear anymore, exactly. Mm -hmm. I see it just as an awareness of myself as vulnerable, other people as vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Like people mm -hmm. have taught me to treat other people in mm -hmm. ways to recognize the preciousness of their lives, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is equally precious to my own life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a, you can get stuck in it. You can get stuck yeah, you can. There, or you can go through it as a doorway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just have a sense of the abundance of the present moment. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. I, I, uh, the other place where I found myself getting stuck, and I don't know whether you felt this too, but um, it took me a long time to realize I can't go back to where I was, you know. And uh, this year I broke quite a few bones and had quite a few accidents. And at, at, for quite a while, I just wanted to get myself really better and strong so I could go back to where I was. But I kept falling down with that attitude. And I finally realized that, no, there's no going back. You know, I have to be here and go forward. And then somehow my accidents started, stopped um, happening. Did you have that feeling of, I mean, it is a sad thing to have to let go of the things you love. I mean, I love to dance, I love to garden, I love to run, 
but because of my injuries, it's not possible. So that took me a long time. And what took me a whole year to figure that one out? Well, you know, I remember talking with you one evening in one of our, our phone calls, which are so funny. They're such a delight. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking, saying that be, being old, really old, almost, I've had this experience before, and the experience was the experience of being adolescent. Mm -hmm. your body starts changing and yeah. suddenly you know you're you're four inches taller mm -hmm. or um various very powerful things happen and and you you're just not the person you were not your clothes don't fit you anymore my clothes <laughs> don't fit me anymore i'm three inches shorter than i used to be the kitchen yeah. counters are much too high for me right now it's hard to cut you know a tomato on a counter that comes up to here on you, you know? And there are many, many physical changes. So that business of getting out of bed in the morning, putting your feet on the floor and saying, okay, what body am I inhabiting today? What's going to work? What's not going to work? Is my right eye going to see or is it not going to see? Uh, does, does anything? And then very slowly standing up and being grateful for your feet Whoever thought you'd be grateful for your feet <laughs> yeah. or anything else? I don't think I've lived a life in gratitude. I do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you I, have I both. Think, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say you have both mentioned gratitude sounding like it's something of a practice. So I, I, I'm wondering if you might elaborate. What what kind of practices are you both? Are you meditators, uh, or do you use other kinds of of a practice to to give you this sense of of uh, being glad to be here. Oh well, you know I think our my practice is just I turned old. Um, yeah. Because I turned old, I I'm grat I have gratitude for every every part of my body. I know Rachel, you talked about that too. How now now you notice your body so much more. Every part of it. Me too. And with that noticing comes just incredible gratitude um but i think that living is my practice is just plain living there's no you know routine or ritual that i do it's just like being in this holy body in a new way is is a practice mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing for granted Steve. nothing mm -mm. I mean, no. uh, there's that level of newness and change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's all very fluid. So the fact that I can see pretty well today, that's great. Because I, I couldn't see that well yesterday. And I'll probably be able to, maybe I'll be able to see even better tomorrow, or it'll go back to being, you know, poor vision. Everything is dynamic. Yeah. And what works whatever works is a gift. I mean, I, I was serious about saying, I'm grateful for my feet. They don't hurt. They're not swollen today. They are, they're, they're flat on the ground. I can feel the ground. Mm -hmm. You know, I have lost my sense of taste and smell, which is something that happens for older people. It also happens, obviously, in coronavirus. But it happens for quite a few older people. And every so often, it lets go and I can taste a cup of coffee. I can't oh. tell you how wonderful that cup of coffee is when that happens. Yeah, yeah. That's so it's, uh, there are yeah. things you can't count on. The things yeah. you sort of took for granted, you can't count on them. But, um, yeah, we live, we live in the place of not knowing, you know. Yeah. And that's a meditation. Living in the place of not knowing is a goal of meditation. All day puts you there. And the whole thing is to go. You know, I paid for, for my ticket. I might as well take the trip. You know, to actually move with this instead of fighting it or denying it. You move with it, you get into a place that is 
extraordinarily alive. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And I, I think with COVID now that the whole world is really living in that place of not knowing uh, for one of the first times on, as in, in our lifetime, everybody is there. So being old is experienced in some way by many, many people, but in different ways, of course, but that thing of not knowing uh, is is so important. And, and Rachel, you and I were there when the Dalai Lama said, uh, I sit at the table not knowing and invite you all to join me there. And I thought, well, here we are, you know, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and of course, in Santre work, we were always there. That was the place where revelation will come through if we can relax into that place. And see, see, this is what's so interesting though, isn't it? But mm -hmm. as a young person, all this effort to get into this place, let's say the place of not knowing. Mm -hmm. And as an older person, all you have to do is allow yourself to be aware of where you indeed are. And you are in the place of not knowing. Yeah. I don't even know that I'm going to be able to get out of this chair at the end of this, this right. time we have together. I have no idea. <laughs> so discovery... Yeah. And not knowing. And the not knowing leads to a deep appreciation of what is in this moment. That's so true. And I can't help thinking, I've sounded like a, you know, I've heard people say this to me about meditation, and I'm not a meditator. But I've become that, not a meditator, but a person in a constant state of not knowing. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, you know, the people talk to us about us as elders, as if we have wisdom. I don't think what we have is wisdom. I think what we have is consciousness. Yeah. That we get into, we are living in a consciousness that we used to aspire to through practice. And mm -hmm. like old age is a practice. It's a 24-7 practice. Practice is what it yeah, is. Yeah, I think consciousness, and also I would bring the word courage into uh, for us to be aware every day and work walking on the edge as we do. I feel we are courageous people, and this this is real. It takes courage to do a lot of things, but you know, and you can't push things anymore. You know, we have to relax into the flow. And so that's different from being younger where you can push through, you know, and run through and exercise through things. We can't really exercise that much. So we have to really sit with where we are. And um, that, that's new for me. That's new for me. And um, a great learning time for sure. Mm. Oh, Marion, you have mentioned uh, twice, I think, the uh, sand tray work. Yeah. Uh, and so that is part of, for those uh, listeners who are, don't know about that, that is part of our, uh, the Common Wheels Cancer Help Retreats for people with diagnoses who are learning to live with cancer and so forth. So one of the things about that is that you're contemplating maybe for the first time your own mortality uh, coming forth. And so I wonder if you might both reflect a little bit about that. Um, you know, we live in a death denying culture, I think, as well as an age denying culture. So, you know, what are the lessons that you have uh, really the essential lessons that you've picked or gotten from actually dealing with this with other people and yourselves as, as you, as you age? Uh, well, well, thanks for the question, Steve. I, I think one big thing that I carry around with me all the time was this little prayer I would, or opening sentence I would say to people working with symbols is not, now you need to drop fear and judgment. Okay. And once they're dropped, then we can proceed. Uh, if, if that, if that wasn't mentioned, it would come up. I, you know, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. Judge, judge, judge. And then the the revelation of the place of not knowing did not emerge. So that that's something I can share. And um, I think um, that practice at Commonweal really shaped my life. You know, to be a really good listener 
and just wait for things to to be get clearer, not push things around. And the power of symbols uh, is such a power that I've known about since I was eight years old when I painted a snake dancing in the moonlight. And with that one symbol, I realized my work was to be a healing artist, you figure. <laughs> but so I had that experience. And um, based on that and many years of, of being an artist, doing my own healing work with uh, symbols and painting and tapestries, I felt uh, I could work with people who were ill and help them um, uh, come through their illness with more joy and excitement and, and feeling in, in the discovery mode uh, as opposed into the, you know. So sand tray has been a great thing to experience at Common Wheel and, and I'm so grateful for that time. Mm -hmm. Rachel, you've been dealing with uh, these challenges and prospects your whole life. So uh, you've, distilled some of it in your books and teaching. Uh, what can you say at this point that uh, becomes clearer as, as you age? It's different now. It's different now. Um, I just, let me just, let me just run a little bit with that. Um, all of my relationships with people are different now. Mm -hmm. And I realize how much my relationships unconsciously were co conditioned by the future, by things that I wanted to happen, or th things, ways that I wanted people to see me in the future, opportunities that might be possible or impossible, depending on what I said or did right now. Right? And you know, all, all that is gone. All that is gone. I don't care what people think of me. I don't, I don't see them as something that I want to move around so that I have the life I want. I am in this life. And uh, I, don't, I say what is true for me, whatever is real for me, without worrying about the effect this would have on my future. And I didn't realize I was that connected to the effect that things would have on my future. If I say this to my boss, he might talk. Oops, sorry. If I say this to my boss, he might fire me. No problem there. <laughs> I mean, I might not even be here to be fired. So, you know, I say what's real. I live in the real. Mm -hmm. And Mary, in my experience, you've done that more than most people. All your all all the 40 years we've known each other. Yeah. Well, thank I've you. I've gotten there too now. I, I live in the real. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, I also don't expect an outcome, mm -hmm. any specific outcome from something I do. For example, mm -hmm. I plant a tree. I just planted a tree um, in my garden. I'm never going to see that tree become its fullness. It's not going to mature. I will be long gone by the time it matures. But I plant it for, for the future. I plant it for everybody. I'm not planting it for me. And a lot of things that I used to do were planting the tree for me to sit in the shade of it. Mm -hmm. Now I plant the tree because it is a it is a thing to do to participate in life. Mm -hmm. And I, I let go of outcomes. And I feel that way in all my relationships, which allows me to see and hear and appreciate people a lot more. You know, so there's that, there's this thing, and then there's the whole question. See, that opens the door, the whole question of legacy, Mary. You know? And you know, what is, what is it, what do we leave behind us? You know, what, what is our legacy? Um, do, you, do you want your name on a building? Do you want your name on a foundation? Do you want your name on a book? Do you, you know, all of that. And it's not about this. It's not about this at all. And I've been mm -hmm. giving some thought to this. And what I get is this. 
Uh, about 30 years ago, um, I put together a course called The Healer's Art. And it basically enables young doctors to recognize that their ability to make a difference in people's lives goes far beyond their, their, their knowledge, their technology, their tools, um, their training. And that when someone is faced with the unknown and with possible pain and fear that who you are is as important as what you know. And then the, the course basically teaches people how to be present, how to be there as a human being, as well as a highly trained health professional, right? Mm -hmm. So what's the legacy for me? Well, I have students. And because of the course, they are going to doctor in their lives very differently. They're going to relate to people differently. None of their patients will need to be alone with whatever they're facing. They're going to accompany people to wherever they're going. And some of these students will have students also. And those students will have students. And those students will have students, medical students. And 400 years ago, 400 years from now, some person will be sitting in an examining room surrounded by technology that we can't even imagine, facing something very familiar, the unknown and fear and the possibility of death. And their doctor will come and accompany them. They will not need to be alone. And I will be alive in that room as if I was present there even though I've been buried for 400 years. That's what legacy means to me. And then the other thing is to just see it play out, see legacy play out. For example, we were talking just the other night, Marion, about you know, this, this lovely little girl who is seven years old, who is my cousin. And I know her mother. And I know her grandmother, who is my generation. And I know her great-grandmother, who was my grandmother, my mother. And then I know her great-great-grandmother, who was my grandmother. And I know her great-great-great-grandmother. I know these people. I have sat in rooms and talked to these people. And I look at this little girl and I see her great, great grandmother's eyes and smile and her great, great grandmother's tilting her head on the side to listen to you better. And this woman, this great, great grandmother is right there in this little girl. And I'm the only one who, who can see it because I knew them both. So we are a living connection to generations and see watching them play out in various people. Sometimes it's what people love and sometimes it's how they speak or, or even their voices. Some people have other people's voices and they are just, it's just an extraordinary experience. You know, so, there's so many, so many different ways of seeing that become available to you when you've crossed into this country of being old. Yeah. 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 I agree with that, Rachel. That it's never boring being old. It's always some surprise will come up. Um, and, and for me, I like very much going backwards and forwards in time in my pondering when I feel stuck is a way to loosen up the stuckness and, and go towards gratitude. And just want to share um, a picture I made of wanting to um, decorate myself with white dots when I was becoming an elder. And so I, I found a way to sit under a table and take a picture. And so this sort of um, ancient ancient um, picture came 
out. I don't know whether you can see it or not, but there it is. Um, it's of me, under, I was underneath a table with light dots. And so this is a, a reference I use to, um, to soften any um, congestion I'm feeling is going back in time. And one, and one friend said, oh, well, this is an ancient looking picture. And it, it made me very happy to have taken this as a, a, a guide, a guide for, for me now. But the other thing I love to do is what you did, is, did Rachel, is to project forward 100 years. You know, what will this problem that I'm holding so tight to my body and my heart and mind look like in, in, in 100 years? And this is a way that immediately opens up my imagination and curiosity, and I jump right out of any depression that I might fall into. So, you know, we, we have options going backwards and, and forwards now in time, we have, and we have time to ponder these things. So, so I am so glad that, um, you know, we, we can do that. And, and, and not to say that the present isn't absolutely dynamic and so precious to us, but we have the options to to do that. I'm wondering if well, we met, you mentioned fears uh, a while back. And uh, so I'm wondering a little more specifically what those might be. I mean, even though I think I might know, but I'm, you know, as I mean, there's, there's broader impersonal ones in the world. And then there are those about our own health. One of the greatest fears that I, in working with the, uh, older people is the fear of uh, mental decline and dementia, um, you know, which many people in surveys find more frightening than physical decline. That, mm -hmm. So I wonder if you have any tips for how you deal with those fears <laughs> and even how, even how you might, uh, how you, you know, practical tips too, as well as for physical and mental health that you, you have gleaned from your years now. You're both very informed and wise about these things. So, um, you know, I'll just say I have a geriatrician in my family. I asked him, he has many uh, 90 something year old patients who are fairly healthy. And I asked him, what are the three, what have you learned in your 30 years of practice now at that point? What are the three tips to a healthy old age? And <laughs> I kind of was taken aback and looked at me and said, you know, I'm gonna have to sleep on that. Let's talk at breakfast. So at breakfast, I said, what'd you come up with? And he said, well, three things, uh, keep eating your oats, keep walking, and uh, have really good genes. <laughs> so can't do, the, can't do much about the genes. And he said, well, then, okay, have, uh, have enough money. So there's another thing, right? These are things that have been shown. I mean, the, the oats and the walking are both about keeping things moving, basically, right? That's true. <laughs> But I, I would add that one thing that Rachel and I share quite a bit is just our memory isn't always so good. And we do silly things like put sneakers in the icebox and, like, ha -ha. and then we you know, can laugh about them. I think uh, with a lot of my other friends, memory problem, no, it's not a problem. I'd say it's a softening of the memory for a reason because other things need to, to merge. But um, it's a uh, humor is, is what helps me a lot. Just to laugh and not take it so seriously, you know. How how can our mind say perfect for so many years? It's not possible. I mean, perfect in the old way that we think of perfect. But if we can relax again and have a sense of humor and playfulness about it, it's quite interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I remember asking you once, um, "How are you?" And you said, "How are things?" And you said, "Surprising." <laughs> you said, yeah, I, I opened my icebox and there were my socks. <laughs> <laughs> we leave the water on and things like that. But um, I think if we go into panic mode, then we're going to lose it even more, you know. Well, but, if I lose it even more, I probably wouldn't even know I've lost it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> There, there, there are some studies now being done in the homeopathic realm to help out in this area, which should be coming out soon. Uh, and so that's good news. Uh, 
but but in the meantime, before all the remedies pop up, I, I think um, you know gardening and being with friends and laughing and and napping when we need to that that's all good medicine for us at at a certain age, you know. Don't you think? <laughs> ask you a question. You know, I don't know if this has been true for you. It's true for me. At the moment, I know more people who are dead than, than I know people who are alive. Oh, yeah, it's getting there. I know more people who are dead. Mm -hmm. I do. Um, because I've been here for 82 years and a lot of people have died in, in that time. And um, I find that the less I'm attached to what's around me, like my socks and where they are, <laughs> the more they show up and comment, the more I find myself thinking, what would Brendan or Regan think of that? Or, oh. This would be just the sort of thing that Brendan would say or do. Or, you know, mm -hmm. how about Angelus? Mm -hmm. Angelus oh my goodness, wouldn't she love to hear this? And this comes spontaneously. It's almost mm -hmm. like the spirits of those who have moved beyond this world grow closer again. And I don't remember, th I mean, some of these people have been dead for 15 years, and mm -hmm. I haven't, or 20 even, and I haven't thought of them. They haven't come into my daily life, let's, uh, let's put it that way, until recently, and now they make comments. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll actually show up and add, remember what, what I used to say about this, Rachel, this is, this is what I meant. <laughs> Um, and it's, it's, I feel less alone because of that. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. I, I think that's a beautiful thing happening for me too. I mean, lately so many friends are dying and that's the way it is, you know, and, and, but I think this is a place to explore more and more as we go along, Rachel is, is because we're in between the worlds, right? And you once said to me, and so begin to, to feel that more and more as, as a blessing. Um, you know, we, we're never alone because we have so many souls on the other side and here as well. But the one thing about memory loss I have to share because it does work. Um, <laughs> because if I get frantic about losing something, all I do is I just lay down on my sofa here for 10 minutes and then it, it appears in my mind. So that's just a remedy for, for this uh, situation. But share that but yeah you know um i told you about the sand tray i did in my dreams rachel where it showed me where i was in on the life spectrum three quarters of my journey was my or of my friends were in the spirit world and one quarter were in the li living busy world where i was and so that was an interesting revelation through dream time yeah my uh, dear friend, late, late great poet friend, Joanne Kiger from Bolinas, I, I recall not long before she died a couple of years ago, said about somebody else, a friend of hers who had died, well, he's gone off to join the great majority. <laughs> yeah. and, and then <laughs> and she said, and, you know, we're all going to be there sooner or later, you know. Um, I wonder about, so here we are in this... Uh, tumultuous time, challenging time, for all kinds of reasons. Both of you have been engaged in, in the world, uh, you know, uh, in terms of trying to do good things, as it were. And so at this point, what do you feel are, you know, if you had messages or, uh, you know, lessons for younger people on how to deal with, you know, the future and what's coming on? I mean, I know it's a big question, right? But it's a it's a, an important one because you're talking about legacy to to one degree, and part of it now is you know the wisdom of, of people who have actually been engaged in the world. And mm. are there things you would say? You know, you mentioned generations. You know, and the Native American uh, thought about seven generations being uh, the 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 scope that we should think in. You know, so even just one generation, what what would you impart to them if you could? Mm -hmm. I think the virus itself is um, imparting a great deal. 
Um, I think the first thing people get in touch with are the things they can't do or they can't have right now. And that's very painful. And some people become very angry and some people become depressed and some people just sort of try to do the best they can. But then there's something that happens to people's relationships to other people. Some of them get more, get worse, I would say, and some of them get more profound. I've been doing something, I, I, I've been in my house by myself for four months. And I have a little garden, an enclosed garden. It has a, a concrete wall around it, like a traditional Japanese garden. It's filled with Japanese maples and a lawn and all. And I began inviting people over and they would sit masked and maybe 12 feet away from me and we'd sit together. And there we'd be, and we couldn't eat or drink or do all the things. We couldn't shop together. We couldn't do anything but talk. And the conversations that have uh, people I, I've known for years, I've gone through a whole other level, just listening and talking and enjoying their company. And the image I have is that I'm living in this little tiny house in in a place where I'm surrounded just by fields. And uh, there's a path or a road that leads to my house. And I see a, a little bit of dust way out there and it get, the dust gets bigger and it's something coming to, uh, down this road. And they're going to come to my house and we'll sit and talk. And what we will talk about, just the gratitude of having this person in my life I mean, who ever thinks about things? We, I never even experienced stuff like this before. And people who I thought I knew, I know much, much, much better on a whole other level. And I think this may be happening. I think our first response is fear and anger and sadness. And then underneath this is an enormous gift yes. of stopping the world. It's literally what's happened. We've stopped the world. Mm -hmm. And now we can all take a deep breath and be here. And it's very, it's almost like a collective alteration in consciousness. I did one of these things with Michael where I talked about the Messiah and the coming of something which changes our value systems and our goals and our sense of ourselves you know, like the Christ, and that the Messiah is not always a, a man. It can be a happening that takes the great river of, of humanity with all of its values, some of which are very poor, and moves it from a riverbed that's heading in a poor direction into another riverbed that moves towards a deeper, fuller life. And I think COVID may be a messianic event. Beautiful. We're not going back to the old way. We can't. It's too, it's too profound. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. And my and my sense is, uh, uh, the age of greed is now ending, and the age of generosity is coming into being. So we're right in between these two forces. Therefore, it makes sense to sit in our gardens and listen to one another and practice kindness and curiosity and, and listen deeply as this, this shift is really needing to happen because if it doesn't, the earth is going to suffer even more and, and all the people who already are suffering will suffer more. But it's an exciting time with, with, with this potential. And this feeling that I definitely have that, that this is really turning from greed to generosity. And we get to witness this. It's interesting. Uh, the renowned uh, teacher friend of mine, uh, Joanna Macy, uh, who has done a couple of talks for the new school and there's recordings on our site. This is what she has been teaching for quite some time too, uh, with from a Buddhist perspective, but mostly ecological is that there is what she calls the great turning coming, uh, which is going to be not easy and even quite tumultuous and painful, but with a net positive and survival value for 
for all of us, hopefully. And that, that's a very hopeful uh, perspective that I think is sometimes hard to see at this point with all of the various threatening calamities coming our way. Um, so sustaining that uh, level of what Michael, you know, Michael always quotes uh, Valkov Havel about hope versus optimism, et cetera. Sustaining that perspective, I think, is really challenging in these times, uh, mm -hmm. really because I'm a newspaper addict. I read too much news, you know, and uh, Walt Whitman 150 years ago said that's like taking a ba uh, bath and bathing in blood every morning, reading the newspaper. <laughs> but I can't help it because I want to be informed, you know, so. Yeah. so disengaged yeah. from the world. I want to be engaged in the world as I grow older too. Um, but sustaining hope and optimism, uh, I think yeah. it's a challenge. Yeah, the thing is, you know, the greed, uh, greedy part of existence is so deep in our soil and in our ways of being that it really takes, you know, a, a crunching and a, a melipping for it to come out. But, but I think people, there's no other way at this point to go forward. We, we need to do that, that hard work of releasing, if you will, the toxins that have built up, psychological, physical, et cetera, and, and, and then begin to change into the ways that, that flow more and, and that are kinder and that are inclusive of all, all people's well-being. This is my feeling it's such a big change but it's a good one and it's the only one that that i think will get that virus to simmer down i'm i here's the, the changing the topic just a little bit i'm uh i'm aware so i live here in the bay area and we have a technological uh revolution as it were that's been ongoing for some decades now and one of the really fascinating uh, sidelines of this or aspects of this is tech, technological geniuses striving for immortality, <laughs> right? So there's a long stretch throughout history of, you know, the myths of, uh, you know, in the warnings, Faust, et cetera, et cetera, you know, careful what you ask for, that kind of thing. Um, and so right. you think about this, you know, this idea that uh, immortality is is a good thing, <laughs> for lack of a better question. <laughs> I won't even say about is it possible because I have my own thoughts on that. But <laughs> are you asking a question? Is yeah. What do you think? What do you think about immortality? If as as a prospect, I haven't gotten there yet, my dear. I'm still trying to be here. <laughs> I'm just trying to to be here in the present moment. That's my answer to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rachel? Well, you know what I was saying before, that our lives continue even though we don't. We are a factor in, for, for good or for not good, as the case may be, uh, in this world, um, we have efficacy. And um, I wouldn't want to live forever. I think that would be boring, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, I don't know, it's not important to me. Is immortality important to you, Mary? Mm -hmm. well, well, you know, um, I, I think there's an in-between road here, uh, realizing that what we do has I've seen this in my life has an effect much further out than we can even imagine. Okay. It, I just think that's real. Yeah. But it, I mean, right now, right now, right now. How about existing as Marion Weber indefinitely? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> no actions, dear not <laughs> in persona. <laughs> but, but do you find that to be so? If you just notice like, like choo, 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 things go out and and change and and um find their way you find their way like a river going to the ocean um i want to come back to the the idea we actually started talking about was uh 
you know, a, a age and death dying culture focused on youth, et cetera, et cetera. And now we have this aging uh, population in general and a real lot of thoughts about how do we not be invisible? How do we have more uh, interaction, intergenerational activity with younger people? Um, what is the best ways, you know, some lessons about combating the uh, the trend to isolate people uh, as they age, not see them, you know? Um. Well, well, I, I do have a lady who, she used to sit on the bench and she'd hold up a sign and she'd say, elder with, willing to listen. And people would come over, which I thought was really beautiful. But, you know, I think as, I mean, I just love being with young children so much. It really lifts my spirit. And if I could hold up a sign and say, come join me here, I would. But I think um, to to be more, just to, to be there, be, be out there more and 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 noticing more and, and maybe magnetizing more uh, younger people because it's so much fun to be with them. And it lifts my spirit so much to be with my kids and my grandkids and any any young child I love to be with, yeah. I would say that what, what's missing in our society is the concept of the tribe. Mm-hmm, yeah. In a yeah. tribe, the wisdom is held collectively. Yeah. And everyone has wisdom, and it's in that dialogue and interaction there's the wisdom of the young and the wisdom of the old and the wisdom of the people in the middle. Mm -hmm. And everyone is fed by the wisdom of all. Mm -hmm. And our difficulty in our society is that we have lost all tribal connection. Mm -hmm. I was talking to a young man that I talked to periodically on the phone for an hour. We just sort of chat about whatever's up. And he commented that I was the only old person that he knew as a friend. And he is about, what, uh, 40 years younger than I am, 30 years younger than I am, something like that. 40 years younger than I am, yeah. And that's strange that uh, not to have friends of all different ages, not to have community in which everyone has a, participate, a participatory wisdom and that all of that is shared and everyone benefits from it. That's what I think is missing in our culture, a big thing that's missing. Well, it's a mutual benefit, certainly, because you know one of the great uh, concerns now is the epidemic of loneliness, which is not only age-related, it's everybody has more of this from, from teens and kids upward, but I think it's a particularly acute problem uh, with a lot of uh, older people and so we need to find ways to combat that with um, more intergenerational contacts of various kinds, it seems to me. Yeah. And, and also going back to the keys to, to health again, that would have been one that I would have added to my, you know, to the list, uh, the small list, having a social connection, a uh, true connection of people of any age has been shown to really help people's both mental and physical health as they age. It's true. It's true. Here's the other thing, uh, Steve. I've come to think that health is not the goal in life. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you can have a very empty, impoverished life and be perfectly healthy. And I think a lot of people have experienced that. Or you could have a very rich and fulfilling and um, you could be fully alive without being healthy. As a matter of fact, I know a lot of people who, through the experience of not being healthy, have deepened their own experience of being human. Right? And the ability to interact with other humans. Um, so I think that the goal of health is, is, is not all that it's wanted up to be. As I look at myself, my memory isn't what it used to be. My life is much better but my memory's not what it used to be. Um, 
my physical capacity is certainly not what it used to be. My life is much better. I travel better. I have deeper satisfaction, but I, I'm not healthy, as healthy as I was two years ago. You know, so that I have a feeling we need to refocus our goals. And, and along with health comes physical perfection and beauty and all of that stuff, right? The physical body isn't our highest function as human beings. And as you get older and it drops away, sort of, <laughs> you get a sense that what you're left with is more valuable than your physical body. That's one of the discoveries, I think. <laughs> and, um, no, I think I live a much better life now that I am much more infirm than I was even, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. What I keep hearing is basically saying uh, letting go of certain expectations and judgments seems to be key. Yeah, and Absolutely. discovering that what's real is better than the thing that you were aiming for that you judged as desirable. Oh, yes. Well said, Rachel. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree with that. It's it's so surprising how the releasing of old ways uh, is beneficial for our our sense of well-being and our connection to other people mm -hmm. that's what i found that i'm much more connected to more people mm -hmm. since i became more vulnerable and older mm -hmm. i think we need more uh, options more vehicles to to foster those kind of connections though you know where people can find each other um even pre, you know, pre COVID, but certainly now as well. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen, you know, I've been in, uh, in uh, homes, in communities for older people. And I've seen a tremendous amount of connection there that people didn't have before. They had a great fear of moving into a institution of some kind, and then found that they had been in, in retrospect, had been isolated and lonely. And all of a sudden had these wonderful connections with people. Um, and I've also seen it compressed in terms of the expectations uh, in when I used to care for hospice patients. Who with all these expectations, you know, if I'm ever infirm, incontinent, uh, lose my vision, I don't want to live anymore. But when they got there, they said, you know what, I can deal with this, you know, if with, with the course support. And they would say, I can live with this. We used to call it. At, at Zen Hospice, you know, Frank Ostaseski's uh, place, we used to call it moving the line in the sand back. People, <laughs> oh, people will draw a line and say, I won't live like this. But they would realize when they get there, no, this is okay. Um, and I remember a gentleman saying to me, why did it take my, me my whole life to realize that I could live, you know, without all of the things I thought that were, you know, essential and that I'd want to die without them? Well, you know, that's that's what uh, lessons in life are like, you know. <laughs> they come when yeah. they're forced on you sometimes, you know. Yeah, they, they, you bring up the healing power of connection, you know. It's, it's beautiful what you say, how how people who've been alone and they go to a home, suddenly they come to, uh, to life again. And uh, I've so seen it in my own family, yeah. Yeah. And then when we talk about connection, it, we also have to, of course, remember our connection to the natural world is such a, a blessing. And certainly when we're older, when, when nobody's around, it's just like, wow, you know, I have so many crow friends and <laughs> pigeons and birds flying around and, and they are part of my family now. You know, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. That connection deepens as you get older. I think in a funny way, we get more quiet. Yeah, we do. Oh, but quiet. And it's helped me to hear and see better. Because there's so many, I mean, there's a sort of inner commentary going on, you know, 
thinking about things, comparing them to other things, <laughs> you know, so <laughs> much so that I, I didn't see what was right in front of me. I didn't experience it. I'm looking out my window right now, <laughs> and there's a bird feeder hanging there. I feed birds. Um, sometimes a couple hundred of them show up in the morning to sing the, sing the, 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 the sun up. And um, right now there are 40 little songbirds on a bird feeder right outside my window. They're filled with such joy. Yeah, it's such true. Joy. They're, they're, there's enough food there for everybody. And they're all clinging to this, uh, this uh, tube, right, of, of it's filled with, with food. And um, the world is filled with food. It's filled with emotional food. It's filled with mental food. And um, it's filled with food that most people are too busy to eat. <laughs> right? no. And just watching them. I, I sometimes watch these little birds and watch their relationships to each other and how they share the common good. You know, mm -hmm. this bird feeder, the common good. Mm -hmm. And there's room for everybody. You know, so you have to be able to move off and move on and, and move off again and move on. But eventually everybody gets fed. And, you know, I would never notice such a thing. You know, um, as short a time ago as five years ago, I'd be sitting in front of this computer and never look out the window, which is next to this computer, because I'd be doing something positive and forward moving on the computer. Right. Yeah. yeah. As, as life is moving forward right around me, unnoticed. And, and I think that it has been my position for a long time. Oh, that's that beautiful. Noticing what's real mm -hmm. and following goals with great fierceness mm -hmm. <laughs> and focus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. just a little story of change. Um, Michael and I were walking on the beach and I can't run anymore. I said, well, Michael, why don't we just try and walk through this group of birds without making one move? <laughs> <laughs> so we did. I said, okay, here we go. And we did this incredible walking meditation and the birds slowly would begin to open up in front of us, but none flew. None flew, and it took us quite a long time to do, but we did it. <laughs> so that's just an example of shifting gears from being a runner in the Dipsy race to walking through a herd of birds in a quiet way, not to disturb them. Who would have guessed? <laughs> Maybe a Taoist or somebody like that, right? <laughs> both of you, I know both of you have been readers uh, much of your life. I'm wondering if at this point in your lives you have any particular favorite books, uh, your absolute essentials, a handful. Sometimes that list goes down as, you know, as we get older. If you find that inform your, your lives now, uh, that, that you just can't, you know, if you had a, a handful of books that you couldn't live without now that you really wanted to keep, what would they be? Oh, this is not a good question for a person like me, Steve. <laughs> I read one handful. mysteries and spy stories. <laughs> murder mysteries and spy stories. And I learn most of what's valuable from people and whatever is around me. Yeah, I'm not an intellectual person at all. I'm a very intuitive person. <laughs> And uh, I, I'm actually saying this out loud because I've, I've always, it's amazing because I've always traveled with a whole herd of very intellectual people um, and have been a secret reader of spy stories and murder mysteries, <laughs> yeah. So what are the, who, who are your favorite authors in that realm? Oh, just, uh, well, that doesn't even matter, actually. Um, <laughs> Mm. Yeah, it's, writing is something that is, is very um, liberating for me. And I admire people who can capture life, who can create a world such that it's more real than the world you're sitting in in your chair 
holding your device and reading. Uh, I find that um, pure magic. No. And Marion, what do you read? Well, because my eyesight is failing, I don't read much, but thanks to the lenses you brought me, Rachel. <laughs> I am now I, in preparation for this chat. Um, I just thought I better read something. So I, <laughs> I opened up the Tao of Aging um, that is very beautiful. It's perfect for me because the type is large and, and the words are very wise and beautiful. And so that's one book I dipped into. Um, I, um, I, I'm sort of more experiential person just you know, looking at the weather and what's going on in nature. Uh, I um, I don't read it very much, but I am having an operation on the 21st, so maybe I'll be able to read more. Uh, that's, you know, another point that as as we age, if we are lucky enough to have access, we have a lot more interactions with the healthcare system and healthcare professionals. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's true. It's true. I wouldn't be here because of my accidents I've had if it wasn't for that. I right. who would have guessed I'd have titanium steel in my body? Right. But it comes. It comes from the middle of the earth, so I. That, it's okay. Well, there's a lot of uh, you know, and, and Rachel has spent a lot. Spent her career. Trying to improve that system in some ways, the hum to humanize it, et cetera, too. But um, we have now a lot more tools, both you know, technologically in healthcare, but also, uh, for lack of a better term, ethically, to give us choices for advanced directives and laying out what our preferences are. Um, you know, for treatments, uh, both actual and potential ones, did we get into certain situations? I'm wondering if you learn lessons from that that have been valuable in terms of filling out your own advanced directives and things like that? Um, <laughs> advanced directive meaning what you do with your body when you're dead? Oh, no, I mean, well, there's, that's one, that is, that is one. No, I'm thinking about uh, things like, like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> Oh, not to, be, not to be plugged in too long. To, to yeah, right. Things like that. What are your, what are your preferences? And, uh, you know, th these, these, these sort of stimulate and force us to uh, think about what our preferences are and what we want uh, as we age and have more interactions with the healthcare system. <laughs> my preference is not to die and to be here on the sofa with my cat. <laughs> And talking to all of you, I can't go that far at this point, you know, because I'm so much just right here in the moment, but I have not done that really. But I think it's a good idea to consider doing that. But I, I have to say, I have a problem that way. Like I thought I'd never get old, but look at me now. I, I was going to jump over being old. <laughs> it didn't happen. <laughs> so, you know, we all get to die and we all get to have challenging moments in the uh, hospital. And I, I believe I have to review my papers <laughs> and see what I did write down. But, um, you know, um, I like the story of the Native American man who went up on the rock, you know, to die, you know, he let his spirit go, <laughs> but then it rained. <laughs> so he came back in the house. <laughs> uh, yeah, well. That was, that was at the end of Little Big Man, the movie, the famous movie. <laughs> Was it? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, um, I have no idea about that, but I am trusting something very deep that um, I will die in the perfect way at the perfect moment, uh, and I'm not worried about it. This is something your doctor is supposed to talk with you about, so <laughs> I'm, I'm identifying a, a lapse here. <laughs> I'm too old for this. No, yeah. <laughs> Rachel, your thoughts? Steve, I had something like eight or nine major surgeries. Oh. I've been on a ventilator at least twice. And uh, I really have no preferences about this one way or the other. 
Uh, the person who goes through experiences like this are not the person who's talking to you right now at this moment. But I thought um, various times there have been images presented to me about how I would like to, how I would like to actually, what, what, what I would want done with, with me, my body, if you will, or a ceremony of some sort. And the one that sticks in my mind, I don't know where I've heard this, I think it's American Indian, where you put the body into a canoe and you launch it into the ocean. And when it gets far enough away, you fire flaming arrows into it and launch mm. it. Mm. I like that a lot. That feels right. Now, I don't, yeah. think, I don't think my friends would be able to arrange that. That's, <laughs> But that, that's the kind of thing that I think about. I'm not particularly worried about the suffering in the health, because you know, that happens to someone else. Someone else for whom the gods make ready. I mean, would I like being put on a ventilator this very more this morning? No, but I wouldn't be that person. If I needed to be put on a ventilator, the ventilator could look like something beneficent. I remember not being able to eat for six months and there was a machine next to my bed. I was hospitalized for that period of time because that's what they did in those days. Mm -hmm. And the machine made this dreadful noise all night long as it was putting nurture and new nutrients into my, my bloodstream. And one morning, very early one morning, I, I opened my eyes and suddenly I saw it as a guardian Mm -hmm. And it was, it was the doorway to life, life energy. Mm -hmm. And that it was standing there murmuring as it was passing life energy into my body. Mm -hmm. And everything changed. Mm -hmm. you know? So that all I can say is, um, you're not the person who is going to breathe their last breath right now. You're not that person. Mm -hmm. And that person may feel quite differently. Yeah. You know. Yeah. That's right. I hear that. Well, pushing a little more on this, I mean, the advanced directive uh, conversation is really about making sure you have as much control over what's done to you as you can. You know, if you ask most people when they're still healthy enough to answer, they don't want to be on ventilators. They don't want to be, uh, you know, in a severely compromised position. Although, as as we said earlier, that can change over time if you're well taken care of. But it's really about giving a sense of control. And I, I think some of you know. I mean, I've I've been very involved in the past about the choice in dying issue. You know, giving yourself the right to die if if needed, and even in having this legalized here. And we didn't really do that because we thought. A lot of people should choose to die. But what we found was that given that option, people felt more confident and then they don't use it, you know, but they think, you know, they feel they have more control at the end in some way. And it's a double edged sword because a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of this is about giving up, as we've been talking about, about your expectations and feelings of control. But what people want is a feeling that they have control over what happens in their own life and their death and afterwards if they can. So. Mm. You know. Steve, I think this business of having a chronic illness for over 60 years, I've never had control. I've never had it. Any more than I can control the wind. Right. Um, I know how to tack. I know how to sail. But whether I'm in a hurricane or I'm or I'm in a very gentle breeze, that I have no control over at all. Right. And I think control is an illusion. I agree with you. Yeah. In I fact, I pulled a stone. It says to surrender for our meeting here. Oh, Where is? It? I'm trying to get it in the, in the limelight. Oh well. It was pulled. I pulled it three times for, her, and every time I get surrender. Yeah. So I, I I feel also that it's better to learn to sail 
in to new to, to new destinations that are even unknown destinations than it is to try to spend your life trying to control the wind. Oh, beautiful, Rachel. Beautiful. Yeah. Good ending spot. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, we are we are up towards the end here, so I I would like to offer you both the uh, the chance to you know say anything you would like to say that you feel hasn't been unsaid here. I will say there has been a a long a number and and a rich discussion uh, on the chat form here that I you know it's so much on there that I haven't been able to really look at it. but. but but we will have access to that, I think, and there's a lot of wonderful things on there. But but what would you like to say in terms of, uh, uh, you know, a, uh, closing messages here? <sighs> Should I get a puppet out? <laughs> this is the time for a puppet, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say, Guy? What do you say? Oh, is this I have Oh, the donkey, yes. <laughs> the old donkey a puppet, uh, and you have to scratch his nose because he likes that, and he'll say something. What do you say? Well, he enjoyed it, and, and we you, you enjoyed it? Really? Okay. And, um, and we're sad to say goodbye because it's so much fun talking about all of these things that don't normally get talked about. But he says, to be continued. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> it was wonderful to to be here with you, Rachel, and and, same, and same. share even more incredible <laughs> words and ideas and, and love with you. It's just an ongoing joy for me. Thank you, dear. You know, I found a picture of the two of us sitting on a, on a couch. We were about to lead a session uh, of doctors in the Commonwealth. And it is possibly, we look young and beautiful, so it was possibly about 30 years ago. And you have a stethoscope in your ears and you're listening to my heart. <laughs> and you've been doing that a long, long time. And I am so grateful because I think you heard my heart long before I did. Oh, Rachel, how special, how special you've been, my dear friend, ongoing. <laughs> you can deal with all my puppets. <laughs> <laughs> but you have cats, right? <laughs> we didn't mention our, we didn't mention our cats. <laughs> I'm surrounded by them, they're sleeping. <laughs> they're sleeping, it's too early in the morning. <laughs> Oh. I was actually going to mention this. All of us are all of us are animal people with with the companion animals. So, yeah, yeah, that's uh, this is I think the first one we have a saying that it's not really a webinar until a, a cat shows up. But uh, <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> but it's 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 early in the day, and they. <laughs> but still, a donkey did. A donkey did. Yes, yes. Yeah, so with that, you saved us there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. This was a joy. Thank you both very much. It's been a pleasure and an honor to sit with you this morning. And uh, we have uh, a lot more programs coming up. And uh, this, some of those have been posted now in the chat. But uh, we will get this one uh, edited and fixed up a bit. And will be posted in a week or so as well. So uh, thank you all for listening in who are out there in the world and have been part of this. And uh, everybody have a wonderful day. And be thankful. Be thankful for your feet. <laughs> yes, definitely. Oh, much love. Bye, Rachel. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.